turned off for now. You are in the correct space if you are looking for the governor and lieutenant governor's Badger Bounce Back live session on justice reform and marijuana legalization. We are excited about tonight's conversation and look forward to being to hear from you all later on this evening. Welcome and good evening. We are almost at 200 people in this space this evening for the governor and lieutenant governor's Badger Bounce Back live session on criminal justice reform and marijuana legalization. We are excited to have you guys here this evening. I know there have been folks in the waiting room as early as probably about 545. Thank you all for your grace and your patience with us as we're getting everyone transferred from the waiting room into this space here. We want to make sure that we have as many people who want to be a part of the conversation in the space so that they can do that. For those who may not be able to join us or who has a friend or a family member who can't join us, this is going to be live streamed on Governor Tony Evers' YouTube channel. So welcome to all of you all who are joining us that way as well. As folks are continuing to enter from the waiting room into this space, we just ask folks to have your devices muted and your videos turned off. This is a temporary request. There will be an opportunity if you feel comfortable for you to uh, turn your video on and certainly for you to unmute yourself so that your voice can be heard. It just makes it easy for our tech team in the beginning to have everyone starting off with their devices muted and their videos turned off. Thank you so very much. Love to see that we've broken the 200 participant mark here. A few more people joining us. Awesome. Huge shout out to the tech team that makes all of that happen and possible, almost by magic. <laughs> we. of Governor Evers, and you all are here for the Badger Bounce Back Live session on criminal justice reform. I am excited for all of you all who are in the space, and without further ado, I think we are ready to get started. I will turn it over to Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes. Okay, TR, thank you so much. Just want to make sure my lighting is okay so people can see who I am. I want to thank you all for joining us today. I am really excited to be talking about an issue that is very uh, important to me, uh, one of the issues that led me to public service. And so to have you all taking time out of your evening to attend this session means so much. 
And I'm especially excited to hear your thoughts on a topic that I've worked on for so long. And we know that we need systemic change in Wisconsin. We've needed it for a few decades now. And it has negatively impacted far too many individuals, far too many families, and far too many communities, and has disproportionately impacted communities of color, particularly our Black and Indigenous communities in Wisconsin. It's also put a strain on the pocketbook, on our tax dollars. And the problem is, it hasn't made people any safer. That's exactly why the Badger Bounce Back agenda is about investing in people instead of prison. At the end of the 21-23 biennium, this budget will again be investing more GPR funding annually into the UW system than the Department of Corrections, a much needed shift in priorities. We should always put education over incarceration. And our plan focuses on making changes around sentencing and expungements, and also investing in alternatives to incarceration. Our plan also overhauls the juvenile justice system in order to treat our youth with compassion and care and also invest in evidence-based practices. Now, one of the key pieces of this work is finally, <laughs> I guess I could even say finally responding to the social media requests and emails, and, but more importantly, the reality that our state is dealing with, especially in regards to other states in the country, uh, particularly those that surround Wisconsin. That's legalizing recreational and medical marijuana, where we know that there are severe disparities in enforcement. It just makes sense for us to take this step. Uh, there's no reason we shouldn't join the other 17 states that have legalized recreational marijuana. Not only are we continuing to lock people up for something that many people in other states not only do freely, uh, before the same business arrangement that has made people millionaires virtually overnight across this country. It is a waste of money. It is a waste of time, and it is completely unjust. Our budget legalized marijuana and also creates a pathway for people who've been previously convicted of marijuana-related offenses to repeal or reduce their sentences, which is how we work to promote equity. And it also creates a community reinvestment fund to invest those dollars from legalization into equity grants and also sparsity aid. Now, our administration has made significant progress despite the legislature's failure to act. The governor has issued over 150 pardons on his own, and the Department of Corrections has also expanded the earned release program. But everybody who is here today knows that we have to do so much more, and that's exactly why we're having this conversation. But we also know that we need the legislature to partner with us as well. And so, again, I'm eager to hear from everybody tonight, and I want to thank you all one more time for being here. And now I would like to introduce our governor, Tony Evers. Thank you so much, uh, Lieutenant Governor, and thanks all of you. Good crowd tonight for joining us. Last month, uh, we announced our 2021 biennial budget proposal, and I set forth my plan for improving our transportation and infrastructure and uh, making sure that uh, those things are in place. But because I've said this before, the, this budget isn't, uh, isn't my budget, it's your budget. And these sessions are an opportunity for me to hear directly on how this budget will impact your families, communities across the state. Now, our justice system has put a strain on our state and on our communities and on our families for far too long. Obviously, it has disproportionately impacted people of color, especially Black and Native men. It has held back communities from achieving success, whether it's in education, workforce, housing, healthcare, you name it. And there's just no true path forward for our state without justice reform. It's the dot that we have got to connect if we want to make sure our state and our communities bounce back from this pandemic better than before it hit. The bottom line is we've got a lot to change. We can't be doing the things the same way we've always done them because frankly, you paraphrase, excuse me, something a constituent said at our listening sessions, the system isn't serving the people in the system, it isn't serving the victims, it isn't serving public safety, and it isn't serving the future success of our state. We need to change how our justice system works by investing in people, not prisons, by investing in evidence-based practices and empathy. 
and by investing in the communities that have been disproportionately impacted by unjust outdated sentencing and enforcement. That's why our Badger Bounce Back agenda expand, expands the earn, uh, earned release program to help folks work towards release earlier and reduce recidivism, creates an earned compliance credit, more than doubles the funding for TAD by providing an additional $15 million over the biennium and expands the number of community alternatives to, uh, to rev revocation beds. As you know, I am proposing that we legalize marijuana and regulate and tax it just like we do with alcohol. And an important piece of this proposal would be to modify criminal pen penalties for marijuana related crimes to align with the legalization and create a process for individuals serving sentences or previously convicted of marijuana related crimes to have the opportunity to repeal or reduce their sentences for nonviolent minor offenses. In addition to working to correct the disproportionate impact of marijuana enforcement on communities of color within the justice system, we're also proposing using about $80 million of new tax revenue generated by legalization to be reinvested in communities through the Community Reinvestment Fund. As for our kids, we're proposing that we truly overhaul the system by focusing on evidence-based solutions and a community-based approach to facilities so that we can keep kids closer to home. Our plan includes training to ensure kids are being best served by our youth justice agencies with training and understanding adolescent brain development, best practices for engaging kids and, and approaching uh, delinquency and an understanding of the unique needs of girls and L LBGTQ youth. And we're gonna change the way we sentence our youth to require that courts truly consider a youth's risk, treatment, treatment needs and severity of the offense. And as one of only three states that hasn't done this already, we're gonna return 17 year olds to the juvenile system. Because our system should be about both accountability and opportunity for treatment and rehabilitation to get kids on the right track with the right support. These are just a few of the ways this budget gets to work to invest in people, not prisons, but we need your help. Work doesn't end tonight. The budget is now headed to the Joint Committee on Finance and the Wisconsin Legislature for their consideration. And we need you to contact your local representatives and let them know why you support this budget and help us get this budget over the finish line. So with that, thank you for being here and I'll turn it over to TR. TR, take it away. Thank you so much, Governor Evers and Lieutenant Governor Barnes. Uh, so we want to set you guys up for success. The purpose of these conversations tonight is to continue the foster meaningful conversations that we started during the budget listening sessions before the budget was drafted and put out public. And we want to continue that now that the budget has been out there and is public. So in order to set you up for success to get our goal reached today, uh, there's several things I want to let you know. First, I wanna remind you again that if folks were not able to register or be in here in this space with us, that you can watch this live stream on Governor Tony Evers' YouTube channel. I also wanna call out that we have our wonderful interpreters, ASL interpreters tonight, Carly, Nicole, and for our captioning, Peggy. For those who need either ASL interpreting or the captioning, you should have received an email from Amelia in the governor's office that gave you instructions on how to pin um, either of the ASL interpreters so that you can see uh, their interpretation during the course of tonight's uh, conversation. In addition, in order for us to have those meaningful conversations and set you up for success, we are gonna be breaking out into smaller groups since we have over 200 people here in this space. In those small groups is when we invite you, if you feel comfortable, to turn your videos on and certainly at that point to unmute yourselves so your voices can be heard. In those small groups, you'll have several leaders there um, who will be helping you uh, from different state agencies in the governor's office. You'll have a facilitator 
who will be charged with making sure that the space is being shared by those who are burning to say something as soon as we get into a session, and for those who may take a little bit of time to get their thoughts together. Uh, the facilitator may also ask you to repeat yourself because we're also going to have a note taker in that room. And that note taker is responsible to making sure if you choose to share a story or a particular way in which the governor's budget is impacting your life, that we can have that, we can record that, um, that if you have an additional question that we're not able to answer in the moment, that we have that as well. So if the facilitator asks you to repeat your name or which organization you're from, that's why. And last but certainly not least, we have our policy expert. That person will be in the room to do their best at answering any questions that you have so that you can feel empowered to know what is in the governor's budget. That is also why when you register for this event, you would have gotten a two or three pager um, that had the highlights of this topic as it relates to the governor's budget. We are super excited for those that are gonna be here tonight in these conversations that are gonna happen. I will also add the other housekeeping item is that we do have Spanish interpretation here as well tonight. I believe we have both uh, Glenn and Mike on the call now. Um, and what will happen when we go out into the breakout rooms is that if you need an ASL interpreter or you need uh, a Spanish interpreter is that your rooms will be broken out with those things available to you. You won't have to do anything. As I like to say, it feels like almost like magic. You'll just be in a room and you'll have the services that you need. I will note that one of the breakout rooms will include this main room here. So if you don't move when the breakout time happens, no worries, it's intentional. You haven't done anything wrong. It's part of how our tech team has just organized our rooms for this evening. I will also note that if for some reason during the breakout rooms you get disconnected or you need to take a break and you actually leave the breakout room, unfortunately you will not be able to come back into the full space. And we do have a, um, a roundup that we do after the breakout sessions are over where the governor makes some final remarks. And so if you leave the breakout room, you won't be able to join in for that. However, I'll remind you again, Governor Tony Evers' YouTube channel is where you'll be able to see this live streams and a few of our breakout rooms will also be recorded tonight. I think I have hit all of my housekeeping items um, as the last measure to make sure you guys are set up for success before we go into these conversations. We do have the governor's deputy director of policy here, Katie Domina, and I will turn the floor over to her. Thanks very much, TR. Um, as the governor and lieutenant governor both said, Wisconsin's justice system has put a strain on our state, both in terms of cost for corrections and lack of investment in rehabilitation, treatment, and alternatives to incarceration. We can't keep throwing taxpayer dollars into a system that doesn't help our state or our people thrive. We know we can keep our communities safe by holding violent offenders accountable, save money, and reform our justice system all at the same time by using science and evidence-based practices to help us make better decisions throughout the justice system. In order to fully bounce back from this pandemic, we have to get our priorities straight and start investing in people, not prisons. While Governor Evers and the Department of Corrections have and will continue to make important administrative changes, this budget is an opportunity for the legislature to engage in the reform process. This is especially critical as many reforms require statutory changes that cannot happen without the legislature joining the public in supporting action on justice reform. Governor Evers is calling on the legislature to join him in enacting meaningful criminal justice reform, a goal that is bipartisan in other states. Reform and safety go together. The governor's budget reforms the criminal justice system in a way that improves outcomes, reduces disparities, lessens reliance on prisons, keeps communities safe, and reduces recidivism. This budget continues to refocus Wisconsin's criminal justice system on evidence-based practices that result in better outcomes and make our communities safer. The governor is recommending several changes to the way individuals are sentenced, released, revoked, and become eligible for expungement. Additionally, the governor is recommending establishing a sentencing review council to study and make recommendations regarding reforming Wisconsin's criminal code, equity in sentencing, the state's bifurcated sentencing structure, and sentences for violations committed by those between 18 and 25 years of age. The governor's budget also invests $15 million in Wisconsin's treatment and diversion programs and more than $18 million into programs such as opening avenues to reentry success, windows to work, and the earned release program. 
Reforming Wisconsin's justice system must also include changes to the way we treat youth, which is why the governor is proposing to align Wisconsin's youth justice system with best practices. The governor remains committed to closing Lincoln Hills and Copper Lake so we can get kids closer to home as soon as we safely and responsibly can. That's why the governor's budget invests in community-based programming to reduce the number of youth requiring secure placement, rethinks the use of detention, and makes jurisdictional changes that align with evidence-based practices. As mentioned, the governor's budget once again proposes returning 17-year-olds to the juvenile justice system. Finally, the governor's budget proposes legalizing and taxing marijuana, much like we already do with alcohol. This is expected to generate more than $165 million annually, beginning in 2022. The governor proposes reinvesting nearly $80 million of that revenue back into our communities through the Community Reinvestment Fund and into sparsity aid to support our rural schools. Importantly, the governor's proposal modifies criminal penalties for marijuana-related crimes to align with legalization and creates a process for individuals serving sentences or previously convicted of marijuana-related crimes to have an opportunity to repeal or reduce their sentences for nonviolent minor offenses. Not only is reform a moral imperative, but we know funding can be better spent on people. By connecting the dots and investing in things like housing, childcare, and workforce training, we can lift communities up rather than incarcerating them. That's why it's so important that our administration hears how the Badger Bounce Back agenda affects your lives, families, and communities. Back to you, TR. Thank you so much, Katie. All right, what you guys have been waiting for, all 227 of you, uh, in a second, you'll be put into your breakout rooms with your team there. Good evening, good evening. I know those who are on uh, this space here have heard my voice uh, a lot. I'm just gonna do a really brief introduction and then uh, I'm so looking forward to hearing your voices. Uh, again, my name is Keith Williams. I will be serving as your facilitator for this small uh, group breakout. If you all feel comfortable, please feel free to turn on your videos. Um, also in the room with me, I cannot uh, 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 forget to share so we have our policy expert, Paulina, with us this evening. Hello, Paulina. Welcome to the space. And we also have what I like to call the, the champ of the group, our note taker, Anne. Anne, welcome to the space as well. And we will be setting you all up for success in these conversations. I also recognize that we have Secretary of the Department of Children and Families, Emily Umdenson, with us. Good evening, Secretary. It's good to see you. All right, folks, so what we'll do is if you have some immediate burning things that you want to share, feel free to unmute yourselves. Uh, you can also feel free to use the raise hand. I know for some folks that may create a little bit of anxiety, so I will be looking to see if I also see you just visually uh, raise your hand to let me know that you want to speak. I do some uh, prompt questions for this evening, but I have a feeling and looking into eyes this evening that I, I may not need those and the conversation may just flow uh, naturally. Uh, so with that, I will step back and uh, welcome the space for comments. Gregory Lewis, yes, yeah, I recognize your hand. Feel free to unmute yourself. Good evening and welcome to the space. Thank you. Um, I had I, I made a few notes uh, um, for this uh, um, this evening, but uh, um, I have written to um, presidents and legislators about the subject of marijuana law reform, and uh, um, in particular, um, like I wrote to Ron Johnson. Um, and uh, he answered me that a lot of mental wars are filled with people who smoke marijuana. That's not a quote, that's a paraphrase of his, um, okay. Um, but it is true that about 15% of marijuana smokers become mentally ill, but that is in line with the 15% of the general population that suffers mental illness. So. Um, I'm taking the 15% off 
oh yeah, I'm taking the 15% figure from CDC Center for Disease Control figures. Um, and the, the actual percentage for marijuana smokers is slightly higher um, than non-marijuana smokers. But the thing is, is that um, they don't know whether marijuana is smoked in order by mentally ill people to relieve their mental illness or that whether it causes the mental illness. So um, that's that's topic for research. Um, anyway, um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that at that and maybe get to some other notes later. Thank you for your comment. We appreciate you and I'm glad that you opened up our section. It's hard to be the first one to speak. Thank you, Gregory. All right, thank you. Okay. I'm yes, Francis. Oh, I see Francis, and I also think I just heard another voice. Okay, I'm Francis Dombrowski, a uh, volunteer chaplain at MSFD in Milwaukee, and I've heard so many stories of uh, both men and women who are stuck in these jails and yet have tremendous potential. And so I would like to take the point of view of how best to use taxpayers' money. And as it said, as many said already, invest in humanity. And so I think that, uh, for example, I use my money to buy things and possess things, but I also use my money to invest I open the so door I get a return. Uh, and so I think the best way to use taxpayer money would be to invest in uh, treatments, you know, before, during, after, and rehabilitation, so that there will be not only a return of the, the person to their family and to society, but a return for the taxpayer so that it has a safer community. So taking the bigger picture, I certainly approve of the budget and even putting more things, but that's another discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Francis, for your words and your comments. I see folks nodding their heads in agreement uh, with you there. Uh, Gail, I do recognize your hand. I do want to pause, and I wasn't sure if there was someone else who earlier was trying to unmute when Francis was talking. If so, I can put you in the queue. Okay. If not, Gail, I see your hand, and Felicia Williams, I see you next. Um, and you can go right after Gail. Welcome to the space, Gail. Thank you. Um, well, I wanted to address a couple of things and then I'd like to just listen. Uh, first of all, I want to say that my son was caught up at age 17 in this thing in Wisconsin, turning it into 18. Um, that was in 2001. And so we've been talking about this for a long time. Um, I didn't know where he was. He was arrested. He didn't come home. No one needed to get in touch with me for a 17 year old um, because he was considered 18 by the criminal justice system. Um, they crucified him. He's um, black, white. They, um, they basically crucified him for nonviolent offense. Um, so he lived with that and tried to get jobs for years. Um, and um, there was no, I, I, I remember I was so surprised. Um, I mean, just real briefly, he had a, in addition to another offense, he had a, um, a um, retail theft, $30, and they turned it into a fraudulent writing, which made it almost impossible for him to find work in anything. Um, and um, I wanted to talk about that. And then, so that is so long overdue and we've, we've thrown so many people away with that. It's just heartbreaking. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about uh, is the um, Badger, the banning the box that's mentioned down on the governor sheet. That doesn't go anywhere near to what needs to be done in terms of employing people that have criminal records. Wisconsin has a law that's never followed. 
that it's only supposed to be related to their criminal offense that they're not hired. That's never followed. It's not followed on the state level. It's not followed on Dane County level. Um, it's just not followed at all. There are a number of states and I, uh, that have a seven year background check that you only go, you'd only go back seven years. Now I think that um, that would at least help. Wisconsin is not one of them. But if there was a limitation on how far back they could go, um, a year, I think it was a year ago, my son, um, who now works at the federal government, because at the time he was employed there, I don't know what's happened with it now. It was more liberal. It had a five year basically cutoff point for a lot of things. I think that's been changed. I tried to find a little bit more about it, but I couldn't. Anyway, Wisconsin needs to do something like that because they go as far back as they can. They deny employment. It doesn't matter if it's a marijuana conviction or whatever the conviction is. Um, they say that it has something to do with the job that it has nothing to do with. There's no way to enforce it. What are you gonna go do? Talk to a lawyer for every single job you're denied. So that's definitely something that needs to be done. And as far as the, the state government goes, that can be done without a legislation. That can be done with a conversation with DOA and the uh, personnel management department of that because a lot of those um, things continue at the state level with state employment. Um, and that's, um, that's I've definitely say that it's we're long past due to, um, to decriminalize or let you know uh, marijuana and to definitely deal and make the process for people to apply for reductions in their sentences very easy and without expensive lawyer you know having to hire lawyers to do it and I'm done thank you for my ability to speak Thank you, Gail, for your voice. And thank you for also sharing um, about your son. You certainly didn't have to. And so we, we hear you for that. Uh, recognizing uh, Felicia next, but also want to let folks know that I see your hand, Elizabeth, Grayson, and George in that order. Um, and so uh, welcome to the space, Felicia. The floor is yours. Hi, I'm Felicia Williams from West Care, Wisconsin. I just have a couple of questions and maybe we can get this clarification um on this platform for me i don't know if everyone else is um clear on it so my question is on the state level if they legalize marijuana on the state level how does that play into federal um because you have a lot of uh in the state of wisconsin you have a lot of federal employees so if it's legalized on the state level um how does that affect a federal employment job and then um just that was for me because we have a lot of um like if you do community-based or uh, community-based work or um, on that platform that is you know local but some of it is funded through federal grants so for me um because we have a lot of our program bring in um, a lot of youth that we work with um that may uh self-medicate right now because it's not legal um but to get them to when we work with them to get them to the platform of getting them to employment um then it becomes an issue so if, if we have someone that can clarify that information for us for me i would greatly appreciate it thank you tr would you like me to step in on this one a little bit or you got it. All policy questions, Paulina, are totally yours. <laughs> okay. Oh, Felicia, hi, I'm Paulina. I work for the Department of Corrections. Um, I will do my best. So when it comes to federal employment, unfortunately, the state doesn't have jurisdiction over that. So if the federal government has certain rules, those rules would, would just serve over what we would have at the state. So um, if it's specific to employment and grants, it's really specific to that grant um, and that employment. Um, so I hope that answers your question. I know Felicia, I wasn't sure if you were trying to add in there something else. I don't want to cut you off. Okay, good deal. All right. And Francis, I know you were able to speak earlier just for the edification of our note taker. Are you able to share again um, the church you're with so that we have that? 
Do you want me to repeat? Yes, please. Okay, I am uh, Francis Dombrowski a, uh, from MICA and uh, the uh, part-time chaplain at the um, MSFD. And I hear so many stories of the men and women who under the present policies are just stuck there for months at times for a minor violation and so forth. And I would like the taxpayer money to be focused on giving these people who are uh, who have the potential and are not violent and so forth to get a, another chance. And the best way is to invest in them. And uh, I feel that the best way to use taxpayer money is uh, the way I use mine. I uh, use it to buy things, possess things, enjoy things, but I also invest my money for a return so that it makes money. So I feel that the taxpayer money would be best used uh, in investing in the uh, you know, rehabilitation and mental illness rehabilitation, all different programs that have been shown to be effective so that there's a return, not only of the person to their family and to society, to job, but a return uh, for a safe community. All that together will be a great return on the investment of taxpayer money. Thank you, Francis. And I heard correctly, you're with MICA and MSDF, is that correct? Yes. And we'll, yeah, and that would be the Milwaukee Secure Detention Facility, the prison in Milwaukee, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, sorry, I accidentally okay. muted you. Sorry, I was trying to mute myself. No worries. Next I have in the queue, Elizabeth. Uh, welcome to the space. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear uh, you, yes. All right. All right, so um, I'm coming kind of from like a twofold. I do work with an organization um, that helps women coming out of trafficking, um, incarceration, um, substance abuse and stuff. But I also have personal experience with um, my fiance is um, on parole, he's on papers and he's been out for about four and a half years now. He was sentenced when he was about 19. Um, so he spent majority of his twenties while in prison. And one of the biggest obstacles that I see for him as well as the women I'm working with that, especially with those long sentences is their, the, just like the Gail had mentioned about the jobs, they don't, um, you know, they're, they are going against them, even if it doesn't relate to the job that they're doing, it's the, they're being denied jobs, they're being denied housing, they're being denied basically everything. But more importantly, the bigger issues that I've found is with the parole officers and probation, when it comes to some of the substance abuse help. Um, my fiance, for instance, he has struggled along the way with substance abuse. He suffers from PTSD, not only from his upbringing, but from being in prison, you know, constantly having um, somebody watching over your back, you know, the COs, the different things that happen in prison that just creates an environment of trauma. So coming back out into this world after seven years um, and not only being hit with the world, but being hit with all the changes in technology, um, you know, emails, smartphones, all that stuff, and then being expected to work full time, go to group, have a job, you know, do all of these things, and then um, try to maneuver through the world in general. So throughout his substance abuse history, though, and with the probation officers, he would straight out ask, you know, put me in a program, put me in an inpatient program, and they would not do it. He, there was a program he wanted to be a part of that would go from birth up into adulthood and teach him how to see where, where those traumas have impacted his life. He was denied ability to go to that program. He eventually ended up um, having several sanctions related to uh, marijuana and, and drinking, um, you know, went to a halfway house which, which was supposed to help him get you know reintegrated into society but they didn't focus anything on to how to be a family man how to be a dad how to um, be reintegrated into his family all they focused on was making him a single bachelor man get a job this and that but no 
you know, how do you become a whole person, not just somebody that's going to go to work and work nine to five. Um, so I just want to echo in a lot of what Gail said in regards to, you know, they have all these different things set up. You have all these rules you have to follow for probation and parole, but then it, but it's set up where you're basically set up to fail. How do you go to group Monday through Friday from four to seven every day, plus have individual sessions and then have a full-time job? That's basically impossible. Plus, you know, a lot of people don't have the ability to drive or don't have a car or don't have a place to live. Like the, what they're being asked to do is really hard and especially being thrown from a long period of time in prison to just being put out in the world and not having resources, not having support. Um, so I just wanted to speak on that part of the reform bill. And then I had a question about, I read that there was some talk about um, the parole and that you could do almost like the good time, like they do when they're incarcerated, possibly getting paroles knocked down. How will that affect people that were sentenced during truth and sentencing? Will there still be a um, grandfathered in um, behind it? Because that's what he's dealing with. He's tried to get his um, sentence reduced um, or some type of you know, reduction on the probation, but everything is denied because of truth and sentencing. So if this whole reform goes through and there's the ability to try to work on good time or you know, doing certain things to get that reduced, how will that affect the truth and sentencing people? So Elizabeth, the question is, with the reforms that are in place in the governor's budget, is it um, retroactive to those that have already been sentenced? Is that the Correct. question? All right, I, yeah. um, I'm going to write this one down and just double check in my notes if you could give me a minute and I'll get back to you on that answer, okay? Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Paulina, and thank you, Elizabeth, um, and also for sharing um, a personal story with us tonight in this space. Uh, next, I have Grayson. Hey, so I have a couple questions. Um, when I was looking at the uh, budget proposal, I noticed that there's nothing in it about the home growing of marijuana. And I know in Michigan, you can grow about 12, pan or 12 plants per residence. Uh, and my guess, my question is, would we be treating it like alcohol where you, know, you can't go buy a still and produce hard alcohol that you can make beer and wine? Or will we treat it more like tobacco where you can go and buy tobacco and grow it, but you know you don't have that influx of black market tobacco because it's so cheap to buy tobacco at the gas station or cigarettes, cigars, what have you. Um, I know in Michigan, they've said they've seen a rise in black market activity because you can buy seeds at the dispensary and then sell the plants that you cultivate at a cheaper cost in the dispensary. So I guess I want to, first I want to know what is the plan as far as home growing goes, is it going to be allowed as part of the proposal for legalization? And if so, how would it be regulated? Hi, uh, Grayson, is that? Okay, sorry, Grayson, just trying to make sure. So my understanding, and um, if I don't answer your question, we'll have to find more detail, but my understanding is that there are certain limits placed on the sale and possession of marijuana under the proposal. A uh, couple of things, you have to be at least 21 to purchase. Um, you, residents can, can possess no more than two ounces of marijuana and six plants for personal use. Non-residents can possess no more than 2.25 ounces. Um, no marijuana processor or micro business that operates as a processor can make usable marijuana using marijuana grown outside of Wisconsin. A retail outlet cannot sell any products or services other than usable marijuana or paraphernalia intended for storage or use. So I don't think for the six plants are for personal use and not for reselling from home. So that it will be a regulated market. But how are you going to regulate that people aren't selling it? Because I mean, in Michigan, the whole idea is that people would be growing marijuana at home for them to use, but people are going around through a loophole essentially to grow their own illegal stash of marijuana or to sell. Obviously, you know, if they get caught, they get caught and get fined and uh, potentially jail time. I don't know exactly the penalties there, but what regulations would you instill to ensure that people growing marijuana at home aren't then contributing to a rise in the black market? Oh, part of it would be using, um our law enforcement partners, but debt cap is also involved in regulating uh, the market as well. Uh, so we would use the system in debt cap. 
the, the uh, Department of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection. And so how would that work, I guess? Uh, well, Grayson, I think uh, you're looking for specific details on actual regulation. I don't have all the specifics, but what I can do is write this one down and we can definitely get back to you on the specifics about actual regulation. Does that sound okay? Yeah, that sounds it's, it's great. a pretty intense question. Thank you. Sorry, I wasn't prepared for that one. Well, no worries. And then I just have one more, um, kind of more related to DUIs. Um, currently in Michigan, they train officers in two different field sobriety tests. One for, you know, the standard alcohol one, one is for marijuana, which I know that in Wisconsin officers aren't traditionally trained in. They also have um, rapid saliva tests that they have been pioneering in the state. And before COVID struck, they were actually going to do a statewide launch, but then that kind of pushed everything back uh, because obviously it's a saliva test. I guess, how would training of law enforcement to deal with marijuana more specifically um, in cases of DUIs and also for to have, you know, something like a sal rapid saliva test on their person to be able to test if somebody's under the influence at the site rather than a blood test later that doesn't prove intoxication at the time, how would measures like this potentially be paid for? If that would be included as well. So are you talking about who would pay for the tests that law enforcement would administer? Is that the question? Yeah, I guess, is that going to be implemented and how would that be paid for? Because I feel like if you're going to legalize marijuana, you need to have some sort of check on the road mm -hmm. because there could potentially be a growth in marijuana DUIs. Well, my understanding when we pass um, legislation like this, there are authority for administrative rule. And so our specialists in law enforcement, the Law Enforcement Standards Board, Department of Justice would have authority to administer admin, administrative rule and provide guidance to our local law enforcement partners. So um, I don't think that that's a question that can be answered on this budget, but it would be something that um, once it would become law, then those institutions, law enforcement institutions would step up uh, with, with whatever programming and administrative rule authority they have um, and guidance that DOJ, the state DOJ would provide to local law enforcement. Um, so I, I don't have the specifics, uh, but if you want the, the question of who would pay for tests that law enforcement would administer under DUI investigations, that's a pretty detailed question. I can see if I can get an answer for you, Grayson. Does that, is that, yep. is that, yeah, okay. Yeah, I would also add just for the group's edification that uh, this is not unique to how our civic process works. That policy at this level of the governor putting out his budget on any other, not just marijuana legislation, certainly has some specifics, but part of the reason that it's so general is because the governor doesn't do it alone. Uh, so the legislature may make several amendments uh, to what's already in the governor's budget before it actually turns into going into the agency that would have to regulate it and the implementation in this effect. So I just want to add that for Paulina and for Grayson's edification that some of those answers may not be there uh, because policy at this stage in the process that we go through our civics doesn't have that detail because it may not even be that it it goes past the governor's budget, uh, which is why advocacy is so important. All right. Thank you, TR, for clarifying. No problem. George, I know you have been patiently waiting. Uh, welcome to the space. Uh, you feel free to unmute yourselves. And then Ellen, I do have you next in the queue um, and recognize your hand as well. Hi, this is George. Uh, Elizabeth uh, basically uh, asked the question that I was going to ask, and that is uh, how to purge, what, what's the goal or how is the plan going to be implemented to purge those previous convictions? Uh, that was one question. The other one is uh, out of the 165 million projected revenue, uh, Approximately 50% of that will be spent on community-based scientific programs, based programs. Uh, is that just for the first year or is that a continuing percentage that is going to be pumped back into the system to improve the system? Those were the two questions I had. So, so the first question, when you, uh, when you mean purge, George, are you, are you talking about expungement? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, expungement. Okay. Yeah, because I think yeah, there is, that there would is, be a vital... Uh, the governor... I, I think that'd be a vital movement 
are a vital element to make this movement more progressive and more uh, acceptable to the majority of people. Uh, the governor does have um, expungement expansion in his budget. Uh, for those that may not know, Wisconsin is one of only two states with very onerous, currently onerous expungement process and rules. Um, and the governor does expand that and align itself nationally to allow more people the opportunity to um, apply for expungement. Um, and then your second question, if you could repeat it again, George. You guys are, this is a really smart group. You have a lot of questions. I'm <laughs> trying to answer all of them for you. Um. The question I had was the continuing uh, revenue, you know, two years, out, three years, out. you know, we know this is going to happen and uh, it's clearly the path going forward. And my question is, out of the expected revenue, what percentage is going to be pumped back in year after year uh, once it's legalized? You know, is it going to continue at that 50% or as we generate more? Are we going to try to leave uh, a certain amount, a level, put a cap on for educational programs? Uh, well, uh, in the governor's budget, he has the, it's called the Community Reinvestment Fund. Um, it'll fund equity grants at DHS, DOA, DCF. Um, it will, um, it says, me. I'm uh, sorry. Is, I know how it's going to be spent this on the projected. Well, what okay. about year two? What about year three? What about year four? Has anyone looked at a three-year goal, a five-year goal? So the governor's budget is a two-year budget. And so this goes from fiscal year 22 to 23. And so I, as, as the process works, um, once we get ready for the next budget, that's when we would start looking at um, how we can realign our priorities and, and review what's happened in the last two years to make decisions for the next two years. I, I understand. I, I just think that it would be more sellable if we said we're going to pump back 50% of what the revenue is back into community-based programs. So, That's great, that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, George. And for those who may not have their videos on or who are joining us over the phone, I do just want to recognize that Governor Evers has joined us in the room to listen in. Ellen, you've been very patient. Uh, welcome to the space, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, first of all, <clears throat> I really appreciate the reforms that I'm hearing in this budget. Um, they have been long fought for by many of us. Um, there are two things that um, concern me about the prisons and I'm not sure they're really relevant to the budget, um, but I would like to um, express my concern and my hope that uh, people that are incarcerated in our state are going to be afforded the COVID vaccine as soon as possible. They don't have any choice to be able to separate themselves. Um, and the second concern I have is that I hear that women who are delivering babies are shackled during the delivery process. And I think that's just um, inexcusable. And so if that could be addressed within the budget process or some other process, um, I think that would be much more humane. And that, those are my concerns, thank you. Thank you, Ellen, and, and the governor does have that in his budget. I do wanna call out for the group, there's also about 18 minutes left in our session. So if folks have been thinking about the comments that are making and trying to work up how you want to speak, just letting you know we have about 18 minutes left in our conversation. Um, I don't see anybody else in the queue, but again, welcome folks, if you just want to unmute yourself or speak, or if you wanna give me a visual camera on uh, that you'd like to speak, I will look through the list now. All right, Gregory, I see your hand, and then George, uh, you're next. So Gregory, uh, welcome to the space. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add uh, um, that about, it was, well, what was in being bandied about in the news in 2019 was that 59% of the population of Wisconsin um, supported marijuana legalization, you know? And our legislators don't seem to recognize that. 
Um, in early 2020, um, there was um, movement towards marijuana legalization, and uh, it was single-handedly squelched by the president of the Senate. You know, um, I, I, I don't, well, that's all I wanted to say at any rate. So thank you. Thank you, Gregory. And I want to make sure I didn't miss anyone. Holly, did you also have your hand raised? Okay. And so, George, if you wouldn't mind, since you've had the chance to speak, I'm just going to go to Holly first, and then we'll come back around to you, George. Uh, so, Holly, feel free to unmute yourself. Welcome to the space. All right. I'm old. I, 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 can you can hear me now. <laughs> you got it. You did. Okay. We can hear you. All right. I'm a retired social worker in Wisconsin. I worked at MSDF and I also uh, worked at Beer Milwaukee Child Welfare. Um, I feel um, I'm very in a, and I grew up in the 70s. So I'm very pro on legalizing marijuana and also decriminalizing it. And um, as far as a, a juvenile justice, I thought Lincoln Hills had been closed when I had left. Um, it's a terrible place. Um, sorry, it's my dogs. Um, uh, real quick, besides uh, contacting my local representative, what can I do? with more impact. Hello. Yeah. Yep. We can hear you. So your question is, what can you do to have more impact to move forward on policy uh, items, particularly the closing of Lincoln Hills? And uh, legalizing marijuana. I mean, more, oh, I'm just, wait, I'm going to go in the bathroom. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Um, what can I do besides, uh, uh, lo uh, contacting my local representative because I don't think that's enough. No, you're right. I, I, I would suggest Holly that, uh, uh, Robin Voss is the speaker of the, uh, assembly and he is, even though he doesn't represent you in the legislature. He represents us all as speaker of the assembly. I, I, he, he has made himself very clear on a lot of these issues and uh, I would encourage you to contact him directly. Okay, that'd be great. Okay. Good. Thank you for doing all that. All right, thank you. Sorry for the chaos. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, we live in it. Yep, it's all good. <laughs> Did other back up. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, George, we're back at you. Elizabeth, I see your hand as well. Uh, thanks. Uh, now that I see our governor in here, I want to thank him for uh, the phone call today and all that you're doing to address this issue. Uh, it's very appreciated, and I think it's time that we move forward on this issue. Thank you, sir. Thanks, George. Good to see you. Awesome. Elizabeth, feel free. The space is yours. Um, well, since, you know, the two things are kind of put together here where you have the prison reform, probation, parole, but you're also talking about the legalization of marijuana. Since uh, marijuana has been shown to be a good treatment for things like PTSD, depression, anxiety, and other mental illnesses, um, how will, how will people that are on probation and parole still be, um, will it still be held against them if they were to try to, you know, their doctors would be able to give that as a treatment. Are they going to be able to use that as a treatment or if they're absolute sobriety, will that be something that they will not have access to be able to be used as a treatment for them? If they were be able to, you know, if they weren't on probation and parole and they were, were qualified for a medical card, you know, but because they're on probation and parole, would they be able to use that medical card and use that as a treatment? Um, for if they were to have mental illnesses or different ailments that needed, um, they were needed to be able to use marijuana for? Uh, 
Well, I'll try this one too. The, um, the goal is that if, if, uh, if your health can be improved by the medicinal um, use of marijuana, then that's what, that's what you should get. Uh, that and that that it's your some background in some other area should not be uh, a, a barrier. If you need medical marijuana, medicinal marijuana to um, uh, be a healthier Wisconsinite, you should be able to use it. Period. Thank you, Governor, and thank you, Elizabeth, for that question. Devin, I think you, I saw your hand raise as well. Let me just do another scan to see if there are others who are indicating they'd like to speak. Francis, I see your hand as well. All right, Devin, feel free, welcome to the space, and then Francis, you'll go next. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> Hi, everybody, I'm Devin Lawler. I'm from uh, Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Really, really happy to be here today. Really happy to see all of you. Um, and Tony, I want to say right away thank you for what you had just said prior to me taking the mic here um i really do truly have a lot of faith in uh cannabis and how it can help a lot of individuals here i see firsthand actually how many individuals uh see improvement in their lives um they they have more motivation before and after work uh it's it's like a reward system um it's almost like giving a cat a treat and they get to learn new tricks i feel like it, it really it, cannabis can help Learn, uh, help old dogs learn new tricks is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, I think I think it it can also create a new perspective in a lot of individuals. It did for me. Um, there was a point in my life where I was in high school, uh, senior year, and I was struggling really hard. I was falling asleep all the time. I couldn't get rest. I never had I never had a good appetite or a, or a good uh, a good time sleeping. It was difficult for me to both eat and sleep, especially during my senior year in high school. As soon as I found cannabis, uh, it, my GPA just skyrocketed. I went from 1.8 to 2.8, uh, finished my senior year, and I never really got to see my full potential until I went to college a year later and uh, ended up with a degree from NWTC uh, in IT computer support specialty, graduated with honors with a 3.6. I owe a lot of that to finding cannabis. Uh, I remember prior to finding cannabis and, and, and having it in my life, I was asking my parents if there was a way that I could potentially get tested for ADHD or ADD, I thought something was wrong and I couldn't focus. I couldn't learn uh, compared to when I was in elementary school. I was everything st stick to me like glue out. My brain was like a sponge compared to high school. And then as soon as I found cannabis, it was like a light, uh, like a switch just flipped. And ever since then, I've had just my cognitive function has been tenfold. Uh, the only thing I have trouble with now is my allergies, but it is that time of year, so I'm not alone. So other than that, that's all I would like to say. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Devin, for sharing. We hear your voice and those allergies. Whether they say if you're in Wisconsin <laughs> long enough, you're going to develop an allergy either way. There we go. <laughs> Uh, Francis, I had you next in the queue. And then also, Heather, I do see your hand and you'll be right after Francis. Francis Dombrowski from um, Micah in Milwaukee. And uh, my question concerns the children who have been traumatized. And uh, I think it has been shown that uh, many times the trauma turns into anger and into violence, crimes, and jail. Is there anything in the budget uh, that any kind of money for programs or for education for treating these children before they get into the, the criminal phase? That is one of my most excited, I think, elements of the budget. Sorry, Pauline, if I jumped in, I got excited. <laughs> okay, go you're ahead. Ahead. I saw you all meet yourself. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Um, so the question was about programming for children, Francis. Well, traumatized, yes. Yes, yes. There is, the governor does have uh, money in the budget to expand TAD programming um, in the budget. Um, and then uh, the re community reinvestment funds uh, with the legalization of marijuana also is focused on programming in that realm as well. 
for the children. That's that's what I'm correct. And and Secretary it looks like Secretary Amundsen um, wants to say something too. Sure. Secretary. Sure. Yeah, thanks, Paulina, and and thanks, Francis, for the question. This is where um, Governor's favorite phrase, connect the dots, really comes comes into play because um, about a week ago, all of us were hanging out on another Zoom talking about um, all of the great investments for, for kids in this budget. And whether it's K-12 or whether it's early childhood or whether it's significant community investments in both the child welfare system and the youth justice system, uh, this, this budget invests mightily in kids and their families. And I think the big, um, the big shift that we're looking to make as a state is um, when we see those, um, those mental health um, issues pop up with our, our youngest Wisconsinites, um, we, we also know and we recognize that um, this is a, a bigger conversation. This is a conversation about families and it's about communities. And I think what I see when I look at this budget across uh, the K-12 investments, across the, the investments in my shop, early childhood and child welfare, and then some of what Paulina was just talking about with the, the reinvestments of, um, of um, you know, some of the, the proposals around uh, legalization, that, that's a, that makes for a budget that is very supportive of the mental health needs of, of kids and their families. Um, so really appreciate that, um, that opportunity to connect the dots for you, Francis. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Secretary Umdenson. That was what I was referring to as the exciting part is that that $54 million, I think that's the price tag of school-based mental health work um, is exactly that. Heather, thank you for your patience. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself. The floor is yours. Welcome to the space. All right, let's see if I can make this work. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent, okay. My first time on Zoom, so I wasn't sure. I wanna say first of all, that it is so wonderful to see the state moving, progressing, on important issues, and I am really grateful for Tony Evers. Um, beyond that, I'm going to try to talk about the rest of this without getting emotional. I may fail. I promise I'm okay. <laughs> um, I have severe PSD from childhood sexual and other abuse. Um, and my questions are about uh, things like DUI and public use when it comes to marijuana. Um, Right now, as things stand, I can take Xanax and I can go to the store and I can do the things that I have to do, which I can't do with nothing. Um, emotionally, I'm not capable of it. I can't even talk about this without getting emotional, as you can hear, and I'm sorry for that. <laughs> um, now, obviously, we don't want people getting high and going out on the road and driving. And right now, when it comes to things like alcohol, it's a lot easier for us to quantify exactly how much is in a person's system and, you know, get a good grasp of, are they really okay to be in public? Are they really okay to be on the road? Are they, you know, and I think that right now with the, the way things are with marijuana, we're going to end up with a zero tolerance situation. I understand that there's technological limitations that we have to deal with and there's safety concerns and all that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, when I take Xanax, I am much more impaired than I am if I have a small amount of marijuana. Both things will get me through a shopping trip without having a panic attack or losing it and, and generally making a fool of myself. Um, marijuana does it with a lot fewer side effects than the Xanax does. I don't have to come home and crash afterwards. I'm able to think better. It really doesn't impair me to the same level. I guess my question is how are we going to, you know, handle situations like that where it's, it's you know, it's a medical, it's a medical situation and obviously we don't want somebody on the road impaired or necessarily even in public super impaired but how do we walk that line how how you know can will i be able to go to the store in the state of mind that i need to be in to function without risking without risking legal problems i guess that's that's what i had to say <laughs> that's my question Thank you so much, Heather, for sharing. Um, the governor's budget 
does um, what you're asking, which is it legalizes marijuana and the use of marijuana. How the DUI rules play into that um, has yet to be seen again with the authority of administrative rule, but the, the whole point of doing what other states are doing is to provide that relief for you. Sure. Thank so you. Thank you for sharing. Appreciate yeah. It. I, you know, I mean, I have concerns about the specifics, but I suppose a lot of the specifics aren't known yet. I just, I guess more than anything, I wanted to voice these things so that it's a thought that people are having so that it's part of the conversation. So, but that's all I had to say. Thank you. Echoing Paulina's thanks to you, Heather, for sharing and others were not as you were uh, speaking um, about the importance of giving voice to that question, even if all the specifics are not out there. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't share with folks is that this feedback and this discourse is super important uh, to the governor and to those in leadership in his administration. Uh, but I could not end this conversation without also encouraging you all uh, to also share this with the Joint Finance Committee, uh, who is the legislative the first crack at the governor's budget now that it's public. Uh, the governor also uh, mentioned specifically Robin Voss, who's the speaker of the assembly, um, as far as a PowerPoint other than just your legislator uh, to talk to these issues about. Um, and the finance committee has created an email address where you all can share stories and these comments and these feedback uh, with them. Um, and that's budget, B-U-D-G-E-T, dot comments with an S at legis, L-E-G-I-S dot Wisconsin dot gov. Again, where you can go to share your feedback with the Joint Finance Committee is budget dot comments at legis, L-E-G-I-S dot Wisconsin dot gov. So very much for your time, for those who shared personal stories, for your engaging questions um, for us. I see your hand, Gregory. We're going to be kicked out of the breakout room. Our time just went to zero. Uh, and so that's the only reason why I'm wrapping up here, because I wouldn't want anyone to get caught up or cut off, rather. Uh, so thank you all again. Uh, remember, don't the breakout room in our uh, wrap-up comments that the governor will make to the message I'm getting, 46 seconds. <laughs> Thank you, guys. And for the two, Elizabeth and Grayson, someone will be following up with the an final answers to your questions. So I apologize, I didn't get it to you today. Okay, and thank you all. Thank you, Governor Evers. Here. Uh, so happy for the meaningful conversations that have been shared uh, and the stories that have been shared. Uh, and I believe uh, we have the governor back in our room. So I will uh, turn it over to Governor Tony Evers. And now that I'm unmuted, I will. So thanks, TR. And uh, again, thanks all the folks uh, from uh, uh, the governor's office and other state agencies who did everything but you know in addition to facilitating or uh, obviously uh, you know note-taking and, and being policy experts really complex uh, stuff that we talked about today and and so I the the, the good news is that um, lots of people told really important stories about their own lives or other lives that uh, are close to them. And those stories reflected the need for uh, our budget proposals. And, and, and lots of people talked about their support for the budget proposals. Now I will say um, there are 
was uh, I won't name names, but there was there in my very first group there was somebody that was uh, absolutely opposed to every uh, every single thing that we that we are proposing in the budget, and, and and also in conflict with the stories that I heard. Now I'm not doing this to call this person out. I sure I'm sure glad. Uh, that person showed up and expressed his uh, expressed his opinion, but what it what it what it obviously reflects, and the, the point I'm trying to make is that um, there are people that um, uh, think that uh, that we should be tougher on crime, uh, that we should uh, uh, continue down the road of uh, uh, incarcerating folks, and it's it's we should be spending money on prisons and not. Uh, uh, not not preventing people from uh, getting into prison. So I, I just think it's always important, and and I, and I was glad that person was here, frankly, to remind us that uh, this these topics, whether it's marijuana uh, legalization, whether it's medicinal uh, legalization of medicinal marijuana, or whether it's juvenile justice reform, or uh, or adult justice reform, um, that we believe that we, uh, we're headed in the right direction. But the fact of the matter is there's, uh, there's folks out there that believe just the opposite. And so we need to be prepared to have a good dialogue around that. And, and I encourage, you know, a lot of people said, what can we do? And, uh, you know, obviously call Robin Boss, I might say call the legislate, le legislators. I think that's important, but, you know, I would I would reach out to folks in your sphere of influence, your neighbors, your uh, you know your relatives, and have this conversation with them too. I I, I think it's very important if if we want to move forward as a state. So great uh, great stories, lots of support for what we're hoping to do, uh, but we also have to be mindful that uh, um, this is a group that uh, uh, we're many of you were directly impacted by the system that exists. And so we just have to make sure we continue to bring our, fr our friends and neighbors into this conversation too. And the other thing that, it, it, this may seem like a small item, but I, I, it's larger than what most people think. Um, heard stories about the folks that we contract with uh, to work with our present prison population and uh, the importance to making sure that, that uh, uh, those folks that we bring in are doing the best, we are doing the best uh, for our, our folks that are incarcerated. And it's always good to be reminded that uh, those that we, uh, the state of Wisconsin contracts for, whether it's in prisons or, uh, or elsewhere, that we make sure that they're doing the right things and that we're getting our money's worth. So here we go, folks. This uh, this is an important part of uh, uh, of change in the state of Wisconsin, um, and uh, I know uh, many of you are are active active around the, these topics, and I sure hope you stay active because it's it's uh, it's consequential. Uh, this this is a huge inflection point for the state of Wisconsin. Many other states have have made this climb and and have succeeded. And frankly, there is no reason uh, at all that uh, Wisconsin can't uh, can't do, can't get over this uh, uh, these hurdles that that are before us. Just have to stay stay the stay the course. Make sure that we always have our eyes on um, making sure people are are healthy and safe, and uh, and we're doing the right things for them, even as they struggle uh, in in their individual lives. So we're, we're off to a good start. We, we've got good ideas. Let's make sure that the legislature hears about your, uh, uh, your, your stories and making sure that the legislature understands how important this is to do the right thing. Justice reform is an important topic for me and I know it's for all of you. And uh, we just have to keep working hard to make sure that we, we get to the place we should be. So thanks a lot for being part of this tonight. It's a big crowd, an active crowd. And uh, TR, thank you for your good work once again. And uh, I guess that's it, folks. Thank you. Good night. Good night.